Dr. JP, last year we saw the rise of citizen power. Anna's crusade against corruption drew tremendous response. Do you see this as a sustainable as a sustainable phenomena? Do you think that we will see more of this in the coming years? What has happened was the angst, the anger and the frustration and the dejection and the disappointment of the young people and the urban middle classes was harnessed in a brilliant way. And technology and media came together. This probably would not have happened on this scale 10 years ago. In 2003, we attempted the same thing with some considerable degree of success, but definitely didn't have the same kind of traction because the, the media and the mobile telephony and the communications network were not as well developed as today, though it was still a very successful operation on the disclosure campaign. So today, probably India is much more mature in that sense. And there was the tactical brilliance in harnessing these strengths. What we need to do in order to make it sustainable is two things. One, there is no one single solution to India's problems. I wish I could say, give me this silver bullet, this panacea, everything is over. If we try that track, people eventually discover that there will be disappointment. There are many who believe if only there is right information, India will be transformed. If only there is judicial reform, India will be transformed. Now, if only there is Lokpal, India will be transformed. No. All these are necessary but not sufficient. We have to recognize that something much more, many more things must happen and they must come together. That is the path to sustainability. The second is, it's good in the short term that we view it as politicians versus us. But ultimately, if you want to build a nation, it has to be all of us together. The politicians are not people from Mars. They are not Pakistani traitors who come to India. They are indigenous people who came from our society with our help. We are part of the problem and we have to be part of the solution. And unless we are willing to have a dialogue, unless we are willing to see justice in the other party, in the long term it will lose steam. You know, the other day I was rereading Mahatma Gandhi's autobiography, uh, Experiments with Truth. Page 168, I think, suddenly my eye fell on that. Earlier, somehow, it didn't uh, capture my imagination or I, I didn't, it didn't register adequately. Suddenly, one sentence uh, struck a chord in me. Mahatma Gandhi said, he was talking about um, his efforts in India, in between, you know, from South Africa, he came and was trying to mobilize Indian community here and Indian media to, in support of the Indian community in South Africa, around 19, 1905 or thereabout. In Kolkata, he was talking about his frustrating experience and he said, the quickest way of getting justice is delivering justice, rendering justice to your opponent. Actually, he said to the third party, to the other party. If we are not willing to give justice to the other party, we will not get justice. If everything is in adversarial terms, you versus me, and what you do is always bad and what I do is always right, it may be in the short term a good thing, tactically. But in the long term, we'll never get justice. So that sense that it's not somebody else we're fighting. It is an indigenous battle to improve our own society and our own conditions. And we have to have this negotiation, healthy dialogue. While we do not compromise on issues, we must have the capacity for dialogue. Once these two things are there, I think this will be sustainable. But the crucial element in that is recognizing that politics, by definition, is an ethical endeavor. The fact that many politicians and many political processes today are ugly does not make politics per se bad. If you start believing that politics is bad by definition, then you become part of the problem. Mahatma Gandhi was a politician, let's not forget that. Nelson Mandela was a politician. I'm saying was because he no longer is really active in public life. Aung San Suu Kyi is a politician. They can't be greater icons of democracy and political activity in the past 100 years than these three great men and women. And if you debunk politics per se, I think we have created a situation which, which is hopeless. If you recognize that, what happened in the past one year could be a fantastic launching pad for the transformation of India. Otherwise, that could well become just one episode which cannot be built upon. Dr. JP, we know that this battle will be long drawn. It can't be, as you rightly said, it can't be a short term measure. Today Anna is there, people are coming out in large numbers to support him. What will happen tomorrow? I think Anna himself, 
his own personal sacrifice, his work over the past 30 years, his transparent sincerity, they are important. And in a country like India, that degree of sacrifice that you don't even have a family, you're not married, obviously you need nothing personally, it enthuses people. But we must remember, Anna has been working for 30 years, probably 35 years. Only now Anna found traction. Why? Because the moment and the man fused, it's not the man that came first, it's the moment. People of India are disgusted. The time has come when you can no longer push this whole corruption scams under the carpet. It is so, so quote-unquote transparent. Corruption is so, so universally recognized, nobody is able to deny it. People are saying enough is enough. Therefore, individuals, while they matter, institutions matter much more and people's angst matters much more. And I think there are enough people of talent and integrity and commitment all over the country, thousands of them, who are willing to take leadership. Therefore, a few iconic symbols sometimes do help. But the symbols do not make the substance. The substance comes from the people's angst and a sense of direction. And therefore, I am very confident that the people of India, the young people in particular and the middle classes, they have the ability to find direction. And it's our duty collectively to see that that direction is sensible, it's practical, it's doable. And step by step, we achieve what we all deserve to. And as Ashwin said, what we dream of in 20 years, that actually will happen by the foundations we lay today. If we recognize that, I think uh, there's no real danger. Dr. J.P., Anna's close associates are embroiled in controversies. Doesn't it weaken the crusade? No, I don't really worry too much about that. Individuals are always fallible, or sometimes there may be deliberate foisting of cases and all kinds of um, propaganda. These are not important. What you are fighting for is important. In fact, these issues came up when the Bhushans against Bhushans in the first tranche, there were some allegations in April um, last year. Lok Sattva very, very firmly said, whether X personally is totally blemishless or not, is for the law of the land to take uh, cognizance of. What matters at this point of time is, whether what X is saying is right and necessary for the country or not, whether X is articulating what you and I feel and you and I want. Unless we distinguish between these two, each time if you go to the messenger and shoot the messenger, even if the message is right, then the country can never be safe. We must stay away from this extreme degree of scrutiny. Scrutiny is important for the individuals. I have no quarrel with that. If I am putting myself up for public life, Ashwin is now the candidate in Bangalore city for uh, the graduates constituency, the voters have a right to expect blemishless conduct from him. Therefore, he must be up for public scrutiny. But independent of that, what he is saying is important. Now, what he is saying cannot be ignored merely because we are all frail human beings. We get confused. Shooting the messenger is a very bad way of building a country. Dr. J.P., what do you think of Anna and Ramdev Baba coming together? Well-meaning people who want the good of the country, if they understand each other, if they join forces, if they have a very healthy approach to public life, if they learn from each other, it's always a good thing. It must happen across political parties, across regions, across religions, across different approaches, and therefore it's a good thing. But we all must recognize that there is a constitutional order in this country and the constitution is nothing but it's not merely a, a written document. It is a consensual way of doing things. In order to be where we want to be, there is a way of doing things. And for that way of doing things, there must be rules of the game. Even in a family, if four or five of us are there, there must be some simple unwritten rules of the game. If each of us shouts at each other at the same time, even a family cannot work. Therefore, there has to be even an argument, in a debate, in a discussion, in a decision making, there has to be a process. We must respect that. And we must not really think that there are panaceas. Sometimes some of us, in our anxiety to get things done, we have a tendency to exaggerate one or two things and therefore lose credibility.